Good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, it is, it is a real honor to be here. As Simon said, I, I, I was here six, seven, eight years ago attending this conference because it's such a great conference. So I'm kind of feeling the pressure now I'm up here on the stage speaking at this conference. Um, I'm just glad I'm on first so I can get it over with and then listen to all these great talks. So I'm here today to talk to you, which is kind of weird when you think about it. I mean, first of all, it's me up here on the stage, see some clerical error. Uh, but also I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to, I'm going to vibrate air over my vocal cords and move this big meaty piece of flesh inside my jaw up and down, vibrating the, the airwaves, and you're going to listen to me doing that. It's, it seems like a crazy thing to do, except for the fact that, of course, I'll be using language. Uh, maybe the great distinguishing feature of our species, language. The great leap forward that happened, who knows, 50, 100,000 years ago when we as a species developed language. And with language, by you know, moving those vocal cords and that big piece of flesh in my jaw, we can tell stories. I can recount something that happened in the past. And perhaps more amazingly, we can imagine things that might come to be. I could tell you something that might happen in the future. So language is a kind of time travel. And it's all possible because we're speaking the same code base, right? I, the, the particular language I'm talking now is English, and as long as you can decode English, then all these noises I'm making will make sense to you. Even if there isn't actually any information in the, in the words. Like, I can say the Chomsky's famous one, right? Colorless green ideas sleep furiously. And you can parse that. I mean, it doesn't make any sense, but you can parse it, right? There is actually a, a little nugget in there, which is you can take two words out of that sentence, use them as a hashtag, tweet at NAConf, and win a copy of my book. But <laughs> most of the time, the sentences we use also convey some kind of information. So language is, is not just time travel. Language is also communication. So I, there could be an idea that's sitting in my head, and I'll you know, vibrate the air and vocal cords flap this big fleshy thing in my jaw around and transfer the idea from my head to your head. So language is, is almost like a virus. You can't help but take the idea in. I can say to you, don't think of an elephant. Right? And now you've just thought of an elephant. It's, it's the language equivalent of the, the chicken game, which if you haven't played before, sorry, just lost. And this, this, this sentence, don't think of an elephant, is actually the title of a book by George Lakoff. George Lakoff, linguist, he's written many books. He wrote uh, uh, Women, Fire, and Dangerous Things. And he wrote this, Metaphors We Live By. Because he's kind of uh, obsessed with, with metaphors. And we use metaphor all the time in language. We use conceptual metaphor. So when we take uh, one idea and we use the language of that idea to talk about a different idea, uh, the classic example being something intangible. Like, let's say, time. How do we talk about time when we can't touch it, we can't feel it, it's intangible? Well, we use metaphor. We, 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 we talk about time as though it's an, a physical object moving through space. We talk about time flies or time drags. Or we talk about time as though it's a resource. We talk about saving time, wasting time. And time, you can't do any of those things with time. That's not how time works. But the metaphor is very helpful. The other kind of metaphor is the cognitive metaphor. And this is what George Lakoff is, is interested in, um, particularly things like political language. How we frame a debate can, can tip the scales of, of how that debate would unfold. Right? So if we were about to have a debate uh, about um, tax relief, well, before the debate has even begun, we've framed taxation as something you need relief from. Right? The, the, the scales have been tipped. So I'm, I'm very interested in this idea of metaphor and, and analogy and simile and how we talk about what about the work we do. It's such a young industry, right? Um, well, what we do is we borrow from, from other industries. And we're not the first to do this. 
There's a great book called Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud. Who's read Understanding Comics by Comics? Great, right? So it's about comics, but really it's just a fantastic book, and it's written as a comic. And in it, Scott McCloud makes the point that this, this new medium, comics, have to kind of borrow from the existing mediums that came before. And he points out that this isn't new. He says each new medium begins its life by imitating its predecessors. Like many early movies were like film stage plays, early televisions like radio with pictures, right? That it takes time. Now this idea of, of a new medium having to borrow the tropes and the language of the medium that came before, this idea pops up again on the web in this article published in the year 2000 by John Alsop on a list of part, a Tao of web design. Can I get a show of hands of who's read a Tao of web design? Awesome, you are my people. Uh, the rest of you, please read it. It's such a wonderful article. And it's crazy that I'm standing up here recommending, oh yeah, you should totally read this article from the year 2000. But it is relevant. It's amazingly relevant still today. It's maybe more relevant today than when it was written. Uh, and in the article, John says, when a new medium borrows from an existing one, some of what it borrows makes sense, but much of the borrowing is thoughtless. It's, it's ritual, and it often constrains the new medium. And over time, the new medium develops its own conventions, throwing off existing conventions that don't make sense. Now, at the time John was writing this, 2000, of course we were borrowing from what had come before in the previous medium, and that was print. We were trying to figure out how do we get the same level of control that we were used to in the world of print on the web. We did that using clever techniques thanks to David Siegel, who wrote this book, Creating Killer Websites. David Siegel, if you don't know the name, you're certainly familiar with his work because he's the guy who came up with the idea of using tables for layout or having a one pixel by one pixel spacer GIF, right? Hey, listen, that was the only way we could do it back then. They were hacks, yes, but they were necessary hacks. Um, and he did actually recant. Years later, he wrote a piece that said, uh, the web is ruined and I ruined it. Um, <laughs> it's maybe overstating the case. But, you know, he, he was pointing out we could use these techniques, these hacks, to constrain the web and make it work like print. We could get pixel-perfect control. And John, also, in his article, he's kind of pushing against it, going, no, no, no. Um, he says, the web is a new medium. It has emerged from the medium of printing, whose skills and design language and conventions strongly influence it. Yet it is too often shaped by that from which it sprang. Killer websites are usually those which tame the wildness of the web, constraining pages as if they were made of paper. Desktop publishing for the web. So, I mean, John totally acknowledges that there is a lot to learn from this rich, rich history of, of, of print and before print, just writing. So this is clearly the, the second great leap of our species. We had language. Uh, where we can communicate ideas, tell stories, imagine the future, as long as we're in the same physical space. And then we, we came up with writing, and now we can communicate with viral ideas, talk about the future and the past, and we don't even have to be in the same physical place. Someone who died centuries ago can put an idea in your head by putting language onto a medium like vellum or later paper. And you can see this evolution over centuries from illuminated manuscripts to the printing press, Gutenberg, till we get to the 20th century and really start to refine the design. You know, we've got the, the Swiss school of design, the, the fonts and the typography and the grid systems. And there is a lot to learn here. So what's interesting to me though is that what seems to be this, this battle with extremes, right? We've got you know, the, uh, David Siegel talking about desktop publishing for the web effectively, and John Alsop talking about, no, the web is its own medium. It needs to you know, have its own conventions. They seem to be at opposite ends of a spectrum, and yet they actually have a commonality. Because on both sides, when they're talking about this, they're talking about websites, web sites. Now that in itself is, is a metaphor, right? But you don't have physical sites on the web, it's intangible, like time. And yet we chose this metaphor, the idea of a site, a place you go to, a physical place. And, and site actually is pretty good with you know, connotations of a, a building site construction site. That was literally the metaphor in the 90s, right? Like the web is like a construction site. It kind of is constantly under construction. Oh, you want the full nostalgic effect? <laughs> there we go. We're back. GeoCities. But I feel like, you know, then we decided to grow out of this metaphor and use, use more grown-up metaphors. We got, we got professional. So we had to, to borrow from other industries, other mediums. And here's one that 
people are very fond of borrowing architecture. Describing what we do as architecture, whether it's on the design side or the development side, talking about us as architects. It seems like a very appealing industry to borrow from, which is fascinating because if you ever talk to architects, man, it's a shitty industry. Like spec work and awards and competition, it's, it's, not, it's not a great industry, but we seem to hold it up as like, oh yeah, we're like architects because architects are awesome. I blame Hollywood because every Hollywood movie that has an architect in it, um, the architects are always like really nice people. Um, they're, they're always like the, the protagonist, never the antagonist. The, the, the architect is never the villain, right? Um, but we, it's fair enough, it's fair enough to borrow things from something like architecture. For example, I know plenty of designers who would say that this book is the best book about UX that they've ever read. 101 Things I Learned in Architecture School by Matthew Frederick. It was published in 2007. It's not written for UX designers, it's not written about the web, but there are lessons in there that are directly applicable. And there are other works from the world of architecture that have definitely influenced the work we're doing today. Like the classic from Christopher Alexander, A Pattern Language. Right? Now this, I say classic rightly, this is a classic book. A classic book is a book everyone's heard of and nobody's read. <laughs> that is certainly the case here. Published in 1977. And it influenced lots of people, you know, doing things in the digital space. Ward Cunningham, the, the inventor of the wiki, he said, yeah, he was really influenced by a pattern language. So the idea of a pattern language, it's, it's architecture, but, you know, breaking things down into uh, components, right, that, you know, you can change the parameters, reuse them, public spaces, buildings, things like that. Uh, it's a modular approach. You know, later on in the software world, the gang of four, they wrote uh, design patterns. Elements of reusable object-oriented software, and they were directly influenced by Christopher Alexander, this idea of a pattern language, components, patterns, modularity. What's interesting is there's another book by uh, Molly Wright Steenson. Uh, you remember it was a blogger, Girl Wonder, um, and she, she works in the world of architecture, and she's written a book about the influence of architects and designers on the digital space, right? Uh, Richard Saul Warman and information architecture, right? There's a very direct metaphor there, but also Christopher Alexander. And she points out, actually, the funny thing is he's had way more of an influence in the digital space than he ever had in architecture. Most architects don't like him. They think he's a bit preachy, right? But his influence in, in the digital space is, is massive, right? Because here I am talking about modularity and components and patterns. Well, I mean, that is so hot right now. You know, design systems, we're breaking things down into patterns. In fact, I ended up organizing a, a conference in 2017 purely about design systems, pattern libraries, style, all this stuff called, called Patterns Day. And it was great. We had, we had these wonderful speakers, right? Gina Ann was there, Rachel Andrew, Alec Almatova, Alex Barton. It was great. But by the end of the day, I was kind of half joking, saying we should have had a drinking game where every time someone referenced Christopher Alexander, we have to take a drink because, he, you know, the spirit looms large over this. Actually, the full rules of the drinking game I came up with afterwards were anytime someone references Christopher Alexander, you take a drink. Anytime someone says Lego, you take a drink. Uh, anytime someone says that naming things is hard, take a drink. <laughs> anytime someone says atomic or atomic design, take a drink. And anyone, anytime someone says uh, bootstrap, you puke the drink back up. <laughs> so a pattern language, a work of architecture that is directly not just influenced, but is still influencing our work today. The idea of breaking things down into components uh, to reuse. Now, there's another work from the world of architecture that has a big influence on me, and it's a classic book again, How Buildings Learn. It's the best book I've never read. Uh, published in 1994 by Stuart Brand. Um, there was also a, a TV series that went with this. It's, it's pretty fascinating. Uh, and in this, he, he talks about the work of a British architect named Frank Duffy and Duffy's idea of something he called shearing layers. So what Duffy said was that a building properly conceived is several layers of longevity. And he kind of broke these down, right? So you've got the, the site that the building is on. We're talking about geological timescales. And then above that, the structure you hope will last for centuries. And then you've got you know, the infrastructure inside the building that you might have to swap out every few decades, right? Change the plumbing. Uh, and then you've got the walls and the doors, you can change them every so often. Until you get to inside the room, you've got furniture, which you can move on a daily basis. So the timescales, uh, you know, get faster 
as, as you move inward. He, he diagrammed it like this. And so this is shearing layers diagrammed for the building. So I find this really interesting, this idea of different time scales. But there's another factor here I'm kind of fascinated by, which is that each layer depends on the layer below. That you can't have a structure until you've got a site to build on. And you can't have furniture inside a room until you've got the room. You need to have the, the walls there. So each layer is building on top of what's come before. You can't jump straight ahead to furniture without first having all those other layers. Now this reminds me of another idea that uh, the writer Stephen Johnson talks about a lot in his work. Uh, for example, this book, Where Good Ideas Come From. And this is the idea of the adjacent possible. That certain inventions, leaps forward, they can't happen until other things have happened before them. Um, you know, there's a reason why the microwave oven wasn't invented in medieval France, right? Too many other things have to be invented first before something like the microwave oven becomes inevitable. And everything we do is kind of uh, built on this idea of the adjacent possible because, you know, businesses and services on the web uh, are, are on top of a whole bunch of layers of, of adjacent possibilities. So you, know, you can't have Twitter or Facebook or Wikipedia until the web exists. And the web itself is built on all of these layers that have to happen first. We have to have the Industrial Revolution, we have to have electricity, then somebody has to create circuitry, we have to get to the idea of having computers, and then networked computers, something like the internet. And then the web becomes possible. And once the web is possible, then all these businesses on top of the web become possible. Uh, so this idea of the adjacent possible and shearing layers, uh, they're kind of fascinating because I'm seeing a, a parallel there, right? Now, Stuart Brand, who wrote about shearing layers in architecture, he, he revisited this idea of shearing layers and took them out from the world of architecture in, in a later work called the, the Clock of the Long Now. So Stuart Brand is one of the founders of the Long Now Foundation. If you haven't heard of it, it's, a, it's an organization dedicated to long-term thinking. I'm a card-carrying member. Uh, the card is designed to last for a few thousand years as well. They're currently building a clock that will tell time for 10,000 years. Brian Eno's written an algorithm for the chimes so that when it chimes once a century, it will never be quite the same chime. So it's encouraging long now thinking. And in this book, uh, the full title of the book being Clock of the Long Now, Time and Responsibility, the ideas behind the world's slowest computer, he extrapolates shearing layers into something he calls pace layers. So you know, kind of if you take this shearing layers model and look around you, it's everywhere. It's kind of like systems thinking, right? The not Danilo Meadows idea that systems are everywhere. And it's kind of true when it, you know, you look around these pace layers, shearing layers applied to the real world are everywhere. The example he gives is our species. If we look at the human race, we have these different time scales. You know, at the slowest is our, is our physical nature as in our, our DNA, our, our physiological nature. That, that takes, you know, millennia to change. There's physiologically, there's no difference between a, a caveman and a spaceman, right? And above that, you've got culture. And this takes centuries, maybe longer, to accumulate over time. And then systems of governance, not governments, governance. You know, how we're going to uh, run societies. And then infrastructure, you want that to move faster, but not too fast, or it could be very disruptive. And then you get into commerce, trading, very fast moving. And then finally, you've got fashion, which is super fast, right? Um, and by fashion, he means things like you know, popular music, um, anything that's supposed to move fast. Like if fashion moves slowly, that wouldn't be a good thing. It's meant to move fast. It's meant to try things out. You know, what about this? No, what about this? Try this, right? But you don't want that for the things further down. So he's mapped this onto these layers. From shearing layers, we go to pace layers. And they have different time scales. I'm talking about the difference between these really fast layers at the top. You know, what about this? Try this. How about this? today we're doing that? Compared to the really slow layers at the, at the bottom that move slowly and resistant to change. He says, fast learns, but slow remembers. Fast proposes, and slow disposes. And fast is discontinuous, but slow is continuous. And fast and small instructs slow and big by a crude innovation, an occasional revolution. And slow and big controls small and fast by constraint and constancy. And he says, fast gets all our attention, but slow has all the power. Now, once I was you know, exposed to this idea, and there's this, this, this virus that landed in my head, I found that 
I couldn't get it out of my head. I started seeing pace layers everywhere. I, I clearly left where I work. It's a, it's a running joke in every project. We have a kickoff. It's so like, what's the time to pace layers? Like, how long will it be before someone makes a pace layer analogy? And it's like my brain has now been rewired to see pace layers everywhere. It's like, you know, the first time that someone points out that the arrow in the FedEx logo. And there was your life before that, and there's your life after that. You can never, you all seen the arrow in the FedEx logo, right? Yeah. Or what about Toblerone? You, you all seen the, all seen the bear? Oh, huh? yeah, all right. You will never be able to unsee that. Or consider the duck. It's a perfectly normal, ordinary duck, agree? But then your brain's exposed to the idea that all ducks are actually wearing dog masks. <laughs> all ducks are actually wearing dog masks. And now, when I show you the same picture of the same duck, <laughs> you will never be able to unsee that. And that's how my brain feels when it comes to pace layers. I see them everywhere. It's like, I, it's, it's, it's like the crazy wall part of a serial killer's lair in the murder mystery. Like, it's just pace layers. So I couldn't help but apply pace layers to, to the work we do, mapping our medium to pace layers. So let's try with the World Wide Web. Well, we build on top of the internet. We can't have the web before having the internet. So at the very bottom layer, you've got the protocols of the internet itself, you know, TCP, IP, which have been pretty much unchanged for decades, right? They were there from the ARPANET before the internet. And it's a good thing that they're unchanged. You would not want to be swapping out that low layer uh, very quickly. Above that, we've all the different protocols we use, protocols for email, protocols for file transfer, and protocols for the World Wide Web, HTTP, the hypertext transfer protocol. Now, this has evolved over time. We now have HTTP2, but it's been a slow process. And that feels right, that we, sh again, we shouldn't be swapping out too quickly. But it's, it's a bit faster moving than the, the internet protocols. And on top of HTTP, we can put our URLs. Now, I would love it if URLs were right down at the bottom layer and they were permanent and they never changed and they never went away. That, that is the web I want. But I must acknowledge that, alas, you have to work hard to keep URLs alive. And they do change, they do move, they do get destroyed, which is a bit of a shame. But we can work at it, people. We can, we can work on keeping our URLs alive. And then what do we put at those URLs? Well, at the simplest level, we got HTML. It was there from the start, from day one of the web, HTML was there, and it's still there today. But it's evolved, it's changed over time. Uh, initially, HTML had like 21 elements, and now it's got 121 elements. So it's evolved, but it feels like you can keep up with the pace of change. I mean, the last big evolution of HTML was, what, 2010, later, with HTML5. Uh, and we do get new additions every now and then, but it's, it's fine. It's like, uh, we can keep up with it. And then CSS. CSS uh, changes maybe more, well, definitely changes more rapidly than HTML. And that feels like a good thing, right? We kind of want more, give us some more CSS. And now we've got Grid, and we've got Flexbox, and we've got all these great new CSS things, custom properties, right? Um, but it's, I don't feel too overwhelmed by that. I still feel like, oh, no, this is good. We've got new CSS. I'm feeling I can keep on top of this, you know, read the right articles, read the right books, try them out, it's fine. Then there's the JavaScript ecosystem. <laughs> and I, I specifically mean the ecosystem, not the language, because the JavaScript language itself doesn't actually change that often, right? ES six or ES 2000, whatever we're talking about, the evolution to the language, they're, they're, they're not so uh, rapid that we get overwhelmed. But the language ecosystem, the, the culture of JavaScript, that feels overwhelming to me, right? Now, since I've been speaking up here, two new JavaScript frameworks have been released. <laughs> I, it, it, like the pace, like I, I constantly feel like I'm falling behind. Like, oh, I haven't even heard of this new thing that apparently everybody's using. Does anyone else feel overwhelmed by, by this pace of change? Okay, good. Keep your hands up for a sec. And just, just, just look around, all right? You're not alone. Uh, you know, this turns out to be normal. But here's the thing. By mapping these different rates onto this model of pace layers, I actually started to feel better about this. Because let's say the JavaScript ecosystem is fashion. It's going to do this. No, no, today we're doing that, right? Try this, try that. Or it's, oh, OK. It's supposed to move fast. It, it would be bad if it moved slow. It's meant to be trying stuff out. And we see what sticks. Just as with 
with fashion, right, you know, the best of pop music will probably, you know, last and find its way down the layers into culture, a slower pace layer. And with the JavaScript, the patterns that work in JavaScript may find their way down into the slower moving layers. Like to give you an example, when JavaScript was first invented, I'm showing my age here, but I remember, you know, the, uh, the common use cases were there was rollovers, image rollovers, right? And form validation. So, you know, mousing over something and changing how it looks, we'd use JavaScript for that. And if someone's filling in a form and there's a required field, we'd use JavaScript to make sure that required field is filled in. Yeah, but these days we wouldn't even use JavaScript for either of those. We'd use CSS to do rollovers. We'd use HTML to have just one required attribute. So the pattern, you know, it's stuck. The spaghetti stuck to the wall and it moved down the layers into something more stable. And that's what JavaScript kind of supposed to do. When we were trying to figure out responsive images, we had JavaScript solutions until we got to something that was further down the stack in HTML. So I do feel overwhelmed by the pace of change, right? But I'm starting to feel a little better about feeling overwhelmed, that it's OK. We, JavaScript is meant to feel overwhelming. It's where we try stuff out. It's where stuff moves fast. Now, the other thing I realized by, by mapping our technology stack of the web onto this pace layer model is that this is how I build. When I'm building a website, I pretty much start at the, the, the third layer. I don't, I don't worry about the, you know, is the internet on? But I think I start with URLs. You know, I think URL design is a really good place to start designing. And it is, it is a design discipline, a neglected one, but it is design. And then I think about the, the content. And then structure that content using the best available markup with HTML. And think about the presentation, maybe on small screen first, and then the presentation on larger screen using CSS. And then start thinking about extra behaviors that I can't get with HTML and CSS. So I, I reach for JavaScript to add those extra behaviors. And this seems to me to make sense as a way of building on the web because it maps to the, the structure of the pace layers of the web. But it's also a testament to the flexibility of the web, you don't have to build this way. If you don't want to build in this, in this layered way, you don't have to. In fact, you can build like this, right? You can put something that's on the internet, but you just do everything in JavaScript. URL routing, let's do that in the browser in JavaScript. Uh, the, the document object model, let's generate that in the browser in JavaScript. CSS, apparently we're doing it in JS now. And so everything in JavaScript. This is an absolutely legitimate choice. You can choose to build things on the web like this. The web allows this. Again, it's a testament to the flexibility of the web. Now, personally, I don't build like this, and this doesn't feel quite right to me. It doesn't feel like it maps to the web too well. Um, because it kind of turns it into this, this all or nothing situation, right? Where as long as we've got JavaScript, everything's going to be great. But if we don't, like there's nothing. So you end up with this situation where we've turned what we're building on the web into a binary situation. Either it works great or it just doesn't work at all, right? There's this kind of a single point of failure there with the JavaScript. Now, this model makes complete sense in other mediums. And I think other mediums have influenced our thinking on the web. And maybe we've borrowed the, the metaphors of these other mediums. For example, if you're building a native app, this makes complete sense. If you're building an iOS app, and I have an iOS device, it works great. I get 100% of what you design. But if you build an iOS app and I have, say, an Android device, it doesn't work at all. You can't install an iOS app onto an Android device. So those are your options. Either it works great, it doesn't work at all. So this mental model makes complete sense in that field. But on the web, because we can have this layered approach, that means we can build like this. We can go from something that doesn't work at all to something that just about works, right? Maybe it's just text on a screen. If something works fine, maybe it's missing a bunch of behaviors, but you know, the user can accomplish what they want to do. If something works well, but maybe the latest and greatest uh, browser APIs aren't supported by a particular browser, and then something that works great, right? the latest browser running the best device, you know, great network. But most people are going to be somewhere on this, on this continuum. You know, nobody, maybe nobody's going to get 100% of what you, what you hope they get, but no one's going to get 0% either, as long as you're building in this way, as long as you're building with, this, with the grain of the web, building in layers, right? one thing on top of the other. Now, I'm going to quote Ethan here. Hi, Ethan. Ethan said, I like designing in layers. I love looking at the design of a page, a pattern, whatever, and thinking about how it will change. If, say, fonts aren't available, or JavaScript doesn't work, 
Or if someone doesn't see the design as you and I might, and is having the page read aloud to them. All right? So in a way, this is a way of busting assumptions. But you know, the what ifs. What if something is unsupported? And by building in a layered way, it's OK. It'll, everything will fall back to the layer below. Right? The adjacent possible. Now Ethan, of course, we all know from this article, Responsive Web Design, published on Alyssa Park. Uh, when was that? 2010, oh my god, nine years ago. Uh, 10 years after John Alsop published a DAO of web design on a list of part. And one of the first things Ethan does in this article is reference a DAO of web design. You could say that Ethan was, was building on top of, you know, that, that foundational layer that was set by John Alsop. So architecture again, responsive web design. The reason why Ethan chose that term, because there was this uh, idea in architecture called responsive architecture about buildings that could respond to the conditions uh, of the people in the buildings, right? Um, that made a really good metaphor for talking about the web on large screens, small screens, everything in between. So this architecture thing as a metaphor, it's not bad. You know, we can learn from it. But I think just be careful not to take it too far. But it's not the only metaphor we use. Here's another one. We don't, we don't talk about ourselves as architects. We're engineers. Yeah, sounds, you know, sounds good. And this, this one you know, predates the web. We've been talking about the idea of software engineering for a long time. I'm actually, I'm very partial to this term, software engineering. Not so much for the term itself, not that I think it's a particularly good metaphor, but from where it comes from, which is freaking awesome. The term software engineering comes from Margaret Hamilton. Margaret Hamilton was in charge of the onboard flight software on the Apollo moon landing. This, this is engineering, right? That is the code base she's standing next to there, which would then literally be woven into the computers on board Apollo. But as a metaphor, engineering, well, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of it. Like, what kind of engineering are we talking about here? Is it material engineering, structural engineering, chemical engineering, aeronautical engineering? They all have commonalities. One being that as an engineer, you've got to know two things. There's the materials you're going to be working with and the tools you're going to use to shape those materials. And I think that we can use that metaphor and apply it to the web. I would say the materials on the web are our HTML, our CSS, and our JavaScript, hopefully in that order. And then we've got the tools we use to design for the materials of the web. Now, the most obvious tools we could think of are graphic design tools. We started using Photoshop, even though that was never intended for web design. But since then, we've evolved and we've got tools that are much more you know, focused on the web, things like Sketch and, and Figma and all this kind of stuff. So these are obvious tools we use to build the web, but there are less obvious tools. If you're working on a web project, these tools also get used. You're going to be talking over email. You're going to be communicating over Slack, organizing you know, spreadsheets, spreadsheets, people. These, we, we talk about these as productivity tools, though sometimes I know it feels like they are reducing productivity rather than increasing it. But uh, it's kind of a misnomer when you think about it. Productivity tools, all tools are productivity tools. That's literally what tools are for is to make you more productive. But I think we should acknowledge that these are legitimate design tools. That uh, uh, you can't launch a project without spending some time in some kind of communication tool. Uh, and then when it comes to the actual welding of these materials, we've got a whole bunch of tools that kind of you know, sit in our machines or sit in our web servers. And now I feel like I'm back up at that top layer of the paste layers. And I'm getting overwhelmed right, with the task runners and the build tools and the the, the chains and the, the transpilers and the preprocessors and all stuff. Was, and, and apparently, you know, changes every week. Now we, oh, you're still using Grunt? No, we're using Go. Go, no, Webpack. That's what's, Webpack, no. It's like, it's overwhelming. It also feels like it's quite complicated, right? I mean, well, this is complicated stuff, but it's like we've chosen it. We've chosen to make our lives complicated in a way. I'll tell you what it reminds me of. Remember that was, um, was that startup, Juicero, right? When they sold a big, expensive, complicated machine to make juice. But you had to buy exactly the right juice packets to put in the big, expensive machine to make the juice. And it works, works great. Big, expensive, complicated machine does its job. But somebody noticed that you could actually just take the packets and squeeze them <laughs> by hand, and it still produces juice. I'm just saying that squeezing by hand is still an option. You can build websites. And squeezing by hand. I think this metaphor has been stretched just about as far as it can go, so I will, I will leave it there. 
But there's this other kind of um, spectrum, I guess, between those materials and those tools. And then there's the people that will be exposed to the materials and the tools. And they kind of fall into to two categories, the engineers themselves and the end users. Right? And when we're evaluating our, our tools and, and asking, you know, is this the right tool to use, we should evaluate it from our perspective, yes, is this going to be a helpful tool to me as an engineer for using that metaphor? But I you know, strongly feel we should also ask, is this going to be useful for the end user? And if those two things come into conflict, what then? Do we, do we privilege our own experience over the user experience? I would hope not. I worry that in a lot of tool choices, particularly on stuff that gets sent down to the browser, right? Oh, I'm going to use a CSS framework. Great, good for you. That's helping you out. But now the user has to pay the cost of the benefit that you get from that CSS framework because they have to download a whole CSS framework, right? So sometimes these things come into conflict, and I feel like maybe we privilege the developer experience over the user experience, and that worries me. A lot of times they don't come into conflict. All those tools like preprocessors and task runners that just sit on your own computer, no direct effect on the end user experience. So frankly, use whatever you like. It doesn't make a direct effect on the end user experience. But when we're evaluating tools, so there's all these questions to ask, right? So like, so yeah, who benefits from the tool? If I choose to use this tool, will it benefit the users? Will it benefit the engineers? Neither, both? There's other questions we ask, like, well, just how good is this tool? And to evaluate that, we ask, yeah, how well does it work? Does this tool do what it says it will do well? And this, of course, is a completely valid question to ask, but there's a corollary that I think is more valid. And that's to ask not just how well does it work, but ask how well does it fail? And what happens when something goes wrong? And this is exactly why I think this layered approach makes sense, because if you build in this layered way, each one of these layers can fail well. If you build like this, then JavaScript can fail well. Suppose something goes wrong, you got an error in your JavaScript, you fall back to something that still works. Not as great as it worked before, but it still works. It fails well. And these technologies on the web, they fail well by design. CSS fails well. Use a CSS property the browser doesn't understand, or a CSS value. The browser just ignores it. Fails well. HTML. Make up an HTML element, throw it into a web page. The browser doesn't throw an error. The browser doesn't stop parsing the web page. It just ignores it, it moves on. It fails well. So, it actually makes sense to like not jump ahead to the, the powerful stuff at the top of the pace layers, but to try and build in layers and stay, stay low for as long as possible. And this is actually a principle, a principle that underlies the, the architecture of the web itself called the principle of least power, that you should choose the least powerful language for a given purpose, which seems really counterintuitive. Why would I choose the least powerful language to do something? Surely I want more power. But the idea is that power comes at an expense. Power comes at the expense of complexity, fragility. The more powerful technology is maybe more likely to fail badly. Derek Featherstone put it well. He said, in the web front-end stack, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and ARIA, if you can solve a problem with a simpler solution lower in the stack, you should. It's less fragile, more foolproof, just works. Right, so the example earlier was rollovers. How are you going to do rollovers? Do it in JavaScript? No, no, do it in CSS. Colon hover, done. Right? Oh, you need to make an interactive button? Use the button element. Be lazy, right? So this, this makes a lot of sense, the principle of least power. Makes a lot of sense to me on the web, especially when you combine it with a universal law that definitely applies on the web, and that's Murphy's law. Anything that can possibly go wrong will go wrong. And this comes directly from the world of engineering. Edward Aloysius Murphy Jr. was an aerospace engineer, and it's because he had this attitude, he never lost anybody on his watch. I think we tend to dismiss uh, things going wrong as edge cases, right? We, we kind of assume that the, the average uh, output, it's not, you know, other industries when they're making cars, they, they, they test them, they strap crash test dummies in, they smack them into walls at high speed, right? I mean. To be fair, a lot of the reason why they have to do that is because of regulation. They didn't necessarily choose to do it, but still, right? Um, can you imagine if they went, well, actually, we realize that most people are going to drive cars on roads, and people driving them into walls is an edge case. So we're not going to worry too much about that. Now, obviously, you want to hope for the best, but you should prepare for the worst. Trent Walton said, like cars designed to perform in extreme heat or on icy roads, websites 
should be built to face the reality of the web's inherent variability. The web's inherent variability. That gets to the heart of it, right? This is, you know, what Dave, Dave Siegel was trying to battle with his pixel perfect labels for that was the web's inherent variability. What John Alsop was calling for was us to embrace the web's inherent variability. It's a feature, not a bug. So are we engineers? Can we call ourselves engineers? Well, let me tell you something in the world of structural engineering. This is the plan for the uh, Quebec Bridge in Canada. Cantilever Bridge. Construction started at the start of the 20th century. There, you know, there was a competition to see who get to design and build a bridge, because that's the way the industry works. Uh, the engineer in charge is named Theodore Cooper. Now, originally, the bridge was meant to be 490 meters long, but Theodore Cooper changed the specification to make it 550 meters long, mostly because uh, up in Scotland, the, the, the Firth of Fort Bridge, uh, he wanted to, that was the longest bridge in the world at the time, the longest cantilever, he wanted this bridge to exceed that. So he made the bridge longer, but he did not recalculate the already high stresses being placed on the material of the bridge. Oh, also, Theodore Cooper refused to work on site. He was down in New York, supposedly overseeing construction from New York. And when it was proposed that somebody should check his calculations, he took that as a personal affront and said, no, 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 that, that won't work. So there was no code reviews happening on this project. Now, someone who was on site, the young engineer named Norman McClure, and by, by 1907, August 6th, he had started to notice that the steel was bending, right, getting a lot of stress. And then again, on August 27th, it had got worse. So Cooper was notified down in New York, and he did send a telegram back to Quebec. He said, place no more load on Quebec Bridge until all facts considered. Stop. Uh, but he was inferring that the work should stop. He never explicitly said, stop the work right now. So the telegram was ignored, and work continued. And on August 29, 1907, the bridge collapsed. And it was shortly before the end of the day. The whistle was just about to blow to signal the end of the working day. There were 86 workers on the bridge, and 75 of them died. Now, something started happening in Canada a few years after this. By 1925, engineering schools in Canada started holding private ceremonies around graduation time. And this was a ceremony that was separate from qualifications. This wasn't about whether you were qualified to be an engineer. This was called the ritual of the calling of the engineer. And you would speak an obligation, an obligation penned by Rudyard Kipling, which I won't repeat here because it's meant to stay within the confines of this, this ritual. And you would also receive an iron ring. And this iron ring would be a symbol of pride of being an engineer, but also a symbol of humility. For the longest time, the myth persisted that the, the iron itself was made from the steel in the Quebec Bridge. It's not true, but the Quebec Bridge certainly looms over the, the, the idea of the iron ring. You'd wear it on the, the little finger of your working hand, so it would brush against the paper or the computer keyboard during your working day as a constant reminder of your responsibility as an engineer. So when we call ourselves engineers, I do have to ask, have we earned it? You know, do we take our responsibility seriously? Maybe we don't call ourselves engineers, but then what do we call ourselves? Does it even matter? Well, we could go back to that original metaphor from the 90s, under construction. Maybe we're builders. We build things. The web's under construction. We're the ones constructing it. It's not so bad, you know, to be the ones literally building the web. It's kind of awesome when you think about it. You know, Christopher Alexander, when he was talking about his reason for coming up with a pattern language, was because he said, most of the wonderful places in the world were not made by architects, but by the people. You know, maybe we're at the bottom of the layer stack here as workers just building the web, but maybe we also have all the power, more power than we realize. I mean, our collective power is greater than anything any architect could wield. So yeah, maybe we're builders. Maybe we're bricklayers, right? I know Simon comes from a long line of bricklayers. It is a noble profession. 
And think about what our building blocks are. The building blocks of the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web, I think, is the next great leap forward. We had language, writing, the printing press, and now hypertext in the form of the World Wide Web. And who gets to build it? We do. With this kind of building block, right? The, the URL, a link. I mean, what an amazing building block that is. I can make a web page and put two links on it, linking to two different things. That, and that combination of those two links has never existed before in the history of the web. We created something new, link by link, building block by building block, building in layers. And I'm reminding of, uh, I'm reminded of an apocryphal story, uh, maybe from medieval times, who knows, of a traveler coming across three workers. And all three workers are doing the same thing. They're building. They're, they're moving stones. They're putting stones one on top of the other. And the traveler says to the first builder, what, what are you doing? And he says, oh, I'm, I'm moving stones. And he says to the second builder, what, what are you doing? He says, I'm building a wall. And he says to the third builder, what are you doing? So I'm building a cathedral. And they're all doing the same task, but thinking about it in different ways. Maybe that's what we need to do. Forget about labels and metaphors, architecture, engineering, building, whatever. Just think about what a privilege it is to be doing this, to embrace the fact that we are the builders, we are the bricklayers. And today, for example, we're going to hear from quite an amazing collection of, uh, of bricklayers that I'm really looking forward to hearing from. Right? I want to hear what they're building. I want to hear their stories of how they built it, why they built it. But to do that, I need to stop moving the air over these vocal cords and flapping this fleshy piece of meat around in my mouth and just stop talking. Thank you for listening.